What I've realized after doing both lectures over the past couple of years, um, it's easy to frame Haiti within an intellectual uh, framework, meaning Haiti is an idea, Haitian history is an idea, Haitian people are an idea, but I rarely hear or see people talk about Haiti from a very personal perspective in that I'm someone from Haiti, I'm an immigrant, what did, that, what did my journey mean? What does it mean for me to be an immigrant and Haitian woman? So um, please just come with me on this journey of how I became a writer and what it means for me to come from the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. And I probably said this three times already because that's what the media has spun and that's what my fellow Haitians have believed. That's what your students in your class will believe. This is part of my mother holding on to her dignity. We were in America now, right? There was free education, somewhat, um, and she dressed me up to go to school. Mind you, this was picture day, but basically this was close to it. If it was uh, any school day, I was wearing a dress to school and socks and getting my hair done in bows while the other kids look like this, right? <laughs> This was part of pride and dignity. And sometimes I was the only kid who looked like this, but these kids were not nice to me for looking like this. Something happened in high school. I skipped middle school because it's traumatic. <laughs> There's a huge transition that happened here. And what I like to do with the young people is say, this is American me, immigrant me. American me, immigrant me. What do you think happened? American. This is what I asked the young people. What happened? Americanized. Americanized, yes. Give me two other words. Assimilated. Assimilated. Assimilation and another one. Yep. Huh? Integration. Integration and adapt. I adapted. Adaptation, right? Uh, I could not do this through high school, right? <laughs> they would slaughter me. So at some point, I looked like everybody else, and I didn't even have to say that I was immigrant, right? Except for my name, right? I, there was no accent in high school. And I went to a all-white high school in Fresh Meadows, Queens. Um, I went to a fancy Catholic school. Um, I don't know if you know the Gaudis. Um, I went to school with Gaudi sons and Gaudi nephews. So in that sense, it was pretty fancy and I could blend into American culture. I could, it wasn't about blending into my community anymore and interacting with kids in my neighborhood. I was interacting with a larger American population. Now was the Italian and Irish kids in my um, high school, the Filipino kids, um, the kids from South America. So in that sense, there was another level of integration that was happening. Uh, this is my crew. Now, I'd like to show this picture because there were, for a long time, my friends didn't know I was Haitian immigrant. Um, and I didn't have to tell them, and they didn't ask, unless they came home and met my mother. And this was where most of the friction happened. Me trying to assimilate into American teenhood versus my mother trying to instill, not necessarily cultural or Haitian values, but just some values, period. Um, I was not allowed to be Haitian. I was told to be American, but not too American, if that makes any sense, right? Study hard, right? Get into a good college, get scholarships, but don't go to the mall on the weekends, right? <laughs> um, you can participate in school activities, but no, you can't go hang out because there's pot out there, right? That's what my mother would think. You can, of course, you can, um, watch American TV, but no ball boys can call you because you'll get pregnant, right? So this is, if anybody has an immigrant parent, these are like the exaggerations where we'll take some of American life, but not all of it. So my mother never spoke to me in Creole, ever in my life. She spoke about me in Creole to her <laughs> friends on the phone. You, you understand? Like there's the difference. And um, I'd be right there in the room and she'd be like, talking about me to someone else in Creole. 
Um, so, but she only spoke in English to me, and it's a hard conversation to have with her. She regrets it, but she said she wanted to practice her English. So I, and I wanted to tell this story. If I wanted to make it modern day, I would have to set it in Bushwick because that's where I moved to. But Bushwick in 1980s, Bushwick now is not the same as it was in 1980s at all. It's completely gentrified. That block that I show you is probably very fancy right now with two, three million dollar buildings and brownstones. I would have to set it in 1980s and historical fiction with young people, it didn't, doesn't have the same impact because I wanted to make it immediate. But there was a New York Times article called Last Stop on the L Train Detroit. The L Train goes through Bushwick and the idea was that people could no longer afford Bushwick. So if they could no longer afford like this very last bastion of affordability in New York City, they could go to Detroit. <laughs> That's terrible, but there were ads telling people to go to Detroit because a lot of the buildings look like that now. Um, I mean, there's more green space in Detroit, but when I visited, there are whole fields that where, where houses once stood, where buildings once stood, and it looked very similar to what Brooklyn, um, Bushwick used to look like, um, and I needed to sell it in modern day city that's grappling with economics and unemployment and violence the same way it did, um, the same way New York City did in the 1970s and 80s. And there are immigrants in Detroit, there are Haitian immigrants in Detroit, and I discovered that there's an American street there, and that intersects with a Joy Road, and I thought that was a perfect setting for an immigrant story.